Hi, my name is Carrie, and I am the lead keeper of the Habitat Africa area here at Brookfield Zoo. And today we are celebrating World Pangolin Day. Um, so I wanted to talk to you all a little bit about what makes pangolins so special. Um, there are actually eight species of pangolin found throughout the world. Uh, four of those species are in Asia and four of them are found throughout Africa. Um, the pangolin species that we have here at Brookfield Zoo is called the white-bellied pangolin and it is found in like the western central areas of Africa. So one of the, be the most obviously striking things about pangolin are um, their scales. They are the only mammal species that has scales across its body. Those scales are meant as a way to protect the animal from predators. So when they feel threatened, they can curl up into a tight, tiny ball and um, essentially just surround themselves with those tough scales. So those scales are made out of keratin, which is the same things that our fingernails are made out of. So if you're wondering what those scales feel like, you can just sort of like click your nail and um, it has a very similar feeling to that. Unfortunately, the pangolin scales are one of the things that make them notoriously known as the most trafficked animal in the world. There is some belief in some traditional Eastern medicine that uh, those scales have medicinal properties and can cure all sorts of things from, you know, rheumatism to infertility. Unfortunately, it's just not true. These pangolins are being put at risk for something that is actually not providing much benefit to people. So that's really unfortunate. But it does make them just so visually interesting just because it is such a unique characteristic. Something else that you'll see is so unique about pangolin is their tongue. So if you get the opportunity to watch a pangolin eating, it's just so interesting to watch. They don't have teeth. So they literally are just reaching out with their tongues and in their native habitats they'd be eating things like ants and termites. They love like little eggs of those species. So they're reaching into those ant and termite mounds and those insects are sticking to that long sticky tongue and they're just pulling it into their mouth. They kind of gum it up a little bit but most of like the processing of their food happens inside their stomach. So that tongue, like when they fully extend that tongue, it's up to like 12 inches long. So, you know, they're like, they're a cat-sized animal. So to have a tongue of that structure is pretty remarkable. And they actually internally have an extra support inside of, you know, it extends off of their sternum sort of into their belly. And it's this firm cartilaginous little ribbing that is actually support for their tongue. So we've had some pangolin here that um, have allowed us, you know, to touch them and stuff and have been comfortable with that. And if you touch their belly while they're eating, you can actually feel their tongue moving. So it's really pretty remarkable. How far can they open up their mouths? They really don't open their mouths very far at all. Um, it really is just open enough for them to bring their tongue in and out. You'll also notice when you watch pangolin that they have very long claws and those serve two purposes. One is that it helps them dig into those ant and termite mounds. It, the white-bellied pangolins are uh, more arboreal, meaning that they climb into trees. So they find like rotten logs and stuff in trees and they'll break those open to find um, those ant species. So those claws are very powerful to help them access the insects that they're looking for. With white-bellied pangolins specifically, it helps them as they're climbing around these tree structures. Because when they're, they're climbing straight up a log or something, you'll see that they move in an almost like caterpillar-like way where they'll grab on with their front feet and then pull up with their back feet. And so they sort of inch along that way. They use uh, their tail, they have a prehensile tail, which means it's a tail that can grip onto things similar to our hands. 
Um, and so they use their prehensile tail as support as they're navigating around the canopy. So at the very tip of their tail, they have, it almost looks similar to the tip of our thumb, where like you can almost appreciate like a fingerprint in there, but it's, it's grippy. It helps them grip at the end, the very tip of their tails. So most of their tail has scales on it, but that very tip is you know, similar to our fingertips where it helps them to grab onto things. So when they're coming back down those trees, they actually sort of wrap their tail around the tree trunk and then they kind of like almost slide down in sort of a spiral around the tree trunk if they don't have you know sort of like a zigzag branching pattern to just climb down they'll sort of slide down that way so that's really fun to watch something else that's really interesting about their tails is that that's how the mothers carry their offspring so um, when the offspring are still small they'll um, ride on their mother's tails and uh, navigate through the forest that way it just shows you from just such a very young age the, the gripping power and the strength that these animals have. So as I mentioned, they're like cat-sized animals. They're like seven pounds and um, they are so incredibly strong. Most of their strength comes from that digging ability. So their, their upper body is very strong and like their grasping power is incredibly strong. But when they are motivated to curl up into a ball, like that's their defensive position. And it is so difficult to get a pangolin who does not want to be unwrapped to unwrap from that little protective ball. They just are so strong and powerful. And that was just so surprising to me as a keeper who gets to work with these animals to see firsthand just how strong they are. So those are some of the things that I just find to be so fascinating about pangolin. There are just so many things that make them, you know, just so unique and so special. Um, so here at Brookfield Zoo, we are incredibly committed to making sure that these animals are here for future generations to admire and um, be fascinated by. So back in 2016, we collaborated with six other zoos and a nonprofit organization to establish the Pangolin Consortium. And um, that consortium is really dedicated to not only the preservation of the species, but just simply learning more about them. There's so much about pangolin that we don't yet know. Over these past five years, through that collaboration, through the collaboration with the consortium and other global partners, you know, researchers and zoos in Asia who are caring for pangolin. We have learned so much and made so much advancement in pangolin care and pangolin conservation. So um, we have a long road ahead of us, um, but it's been very exciting to see the type of collaborative effort that is making like major impact for this species. So if you are inspired by the work that we are doing, uh, please reach out through the zoo's website. You can contribute to those programs through the Animal Care and Conservation Fund. And you can just you know, reach out and let us know what you're curious about learning about pangolins and we'll be happy to help you with that. Why is it red inside this habitat? That's a great question. Um, one of the things that we're still learning about pangolin is you know just their general um, activity patterns um, and so far what we can tell from observation both here at the zoo and pangolin in their native habitats is that they tend to be more nocturnal meaning that they're more active at night so here we would really like for our guests to be able to see pangolin when they're active so um, we have them on what is known as a reverse light cycle where we're mimicking the nighttime during what is normally our daytime and then during the overnight hours the exhibit lighting switches to be brighter and more mimicking of a daytime cycle so really it's so that we can maximize what we're seeing from our pangolin and we're trying to get them active when we're here to see it so one of the coolest projects that we have collaborated with through the consortium is a partnership with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. 
So we have been able to donate pangolin scales that have, you know, just naturally broken off from our pangolin here. And we have donated them to U.S. Fish and Wildlife to use in their canine tracking training. So they are training their canine units to be able to recognize pangolin scale. And um, they are now able to intercept illegal transport of pangolin parts at major airports throughout the country. That's been a really cool project that we've been able to participate in, and it's something that we would not have been able to do without these animals here at the zoo. How many pangolin are left in the wild? We really don't know how many pangolin are left in the wild. For one thing, it's hard to study them just because of their biology. Some of the arboreal species are high up in the treetops and are constantly, you know, moving from different locations, so it's very hard to track them. We do now have some researchers who have been able to fit pangolin with um, some tracking devices to help with that, but really their best observations occur when they dedicate one single person to follow one single pangolin through the treetops. So um, you can imagine how difficult that is in a dense forest situation. And then some of the ground dwelling pangolin are also burrowing species. So again, it's just very hard to track individual pangolin, let alone try to source how many are in a population. There are some creative means to be able to do that through camera traps and you know, identifying feces and that sort of thing. Um, there's also a project out there that is trying to look at DNA in the blood they find in things like mosquitoes and other um, insects that you know are external parasites to different species. And so they're looking at that and trying to find if there is um, pangolin DNA in the stomach blood of those insects. And so by gathering up those insects, they sort of you know use this formula to estimate the population density in those areas, but all of those things just give us estimates. They don't give us true numbers. Um, we do know that the pangolin species that are in Asia are now all critically endangered, and now the pangolin species that are native to Africa are now seeing dramatic decline. It doesn't necessarily give us an estimate of what's left there. So it's, it's very difficult to track that number down. All, all pangolin species are in trouble now because of that illegal transport. Why are people able to illegally transport so many pangolins? Well, unfortunately, it has to do with um, the pangolin's natural defenses. While rolling into a ball is very effective against certain predators, it is not very effective against human poachers. So when people do come across pangolin, it is very easy for them to just pick them up and carry them off. Unfortunately, pangolin's defenses are not made against human poachers. Thank you all so much for joining me today for bringing the zoo to you as we talk about our white-bellied pangolin. We're hoping to see you guys real soon back here at the zoo so you guys can enjoy these animals too.